Welcome to another edition of What Barry's Talking About from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. On this week's program, you've seen them walking the streets of Barry and other municipalities in Simcoe County, picking up used needles and other debris. Who are they? Where'd they come from? We're going to find out. The Barry Baycats launch into the IBL playoffs tonight. We chat with the guy in charge. We'll also get a preview of the new ride Canada's Wonderland. We'll have you shooting out of Wonder Mountain on next year. And what's the island princess doing docked in Barry? We get the conversation started after this. It sailed into Barry's government marina at the foot of Bayfield Street a couple of weeks ago. The Island Princess, a former floating restaurant in Orillia. So what's it doing here? Barry mortgage broker Derek Battaglia bought it and told me he has a few ideas as we sat on the vessel's upper deck. We definitely have plans. You're looking, I think, probably to fill a void that people have talked about for years and years and years in Barry, and, and nothing's ever come with it, and uh, you, you've got some discussions going on to see what you can and can't do and take it from there? Right. So we're, we're just following all the regulations all the different authorities have in place, uh, checking all those boxes. The boat, the Island Princess, has uh, a liquor license and Transport Canada approved for 400 passengers. Um, the five diesel engines have all just gone through a recent overhaul. They're all running very smoothly, but it's not, it's not the intention to actually use it as a tour boat. So not a party boat where a business might want to go out on the water for an evening on a Friday night like we've seen in Toronto? Right. I don't see that happening with uh, the Island Princess. I think it's, it's better suited. At least there's, I mean, there are, there are conversations going on with restaurant chains right now. There's, there's conversations happening with just it being my personal residence. Maybe there's a joint venture with someone who has uh, an idea that may be beyond what I'm seeing. Maybe there's a buyer for the whole project. You're certainly seeing out here in the lake as we stare at it, there's four or three or four separate businesses now operating out in the middle of the bay. A jet ski business, a uh, parasailing business, uh, and two other jet ski type rentals that have just kind of anchored themselves out here flexing their muscles, showing what they can do in the bay. Uh, I'm no different, except I own shoreline, and, uh, you know, that's access. So these things will start to present themselves, I think, over time. And, I, and uh, again, I'm not in a rush. It's making sure I'm doing the right thing for the city of Barrie. I have, have meetings set up with the mayor. The planning department's been involved all the way through. I've spoken to at least half of the councillors at the city to discuss this potential tourist attraction, as well as have other really great ideas, creative ideas. As you know, I'm, I, I do come up with some creative things once in a while for the North Shore area, the trail, uh, that I want to share with the city and get some feedback. I used to live downtown uh, in the old um, um, Turnbull residence. I own that and lived there for quite a number of years. So I have a really good sense of the happenings that coming and going, the traffic flow of that area, which is pretty much where my water lot is. So I'm excited about those next steps, but again, it's not a rush. It's just making sure we do it right and uh, see what presents itself. I mean, a lot of ideas of your own, but you're open to somebody else picking up the phone and saying, hey, Derek, what about? Yeah, exactly. I'm excited about that opportunity. That's why I want to take my time here, because I think there will be a lot of other creative people out there that will come forward with maybe operators. I'm certainly not a, a restaurant operator. I don't have that experience. But I do have children that just graduated university. Potentially there's work for them. Um, so these are the things that I'm, I'm processing to see where all of this lands in the end. And, you know, working with the city is priority for me. Uh, making sure all the stakeholders are, are, are happy, or as many as, as possible. And keeping the authorities that govern this type of thing, you know, up to date with what we're doing. So, and checking, checking those boxes. Somebody uh, listening thinks they've got a, a grand plan that might work with you. How do they get a hold of you? Well, um, Derek.ca, D-A-R-I-C-K.ca is my, my main website uh, that manages a real estate company and a mortgage company. And uh, my phone numbers are there. 
The Barry Baycats finished second in the Intercounty Baseball League this season and will play Toronto in the first round of the playoffs. Also been more chatter about a new stadium closer to downtown. Baycats president, general manager, and field boss Josh Matlow is with Barry 360's Will Conkin. There has been recent uh, chats about a sports field on Lakeshore Drive. Have the Barry Baycats been approached at all about this? Uh, many times, many times. It's a, it's a cool idea. Um, I think everybody would be excited to be, you know, watching baseball or sports or venue or concert or whatever on the water. I think that's uh, a cool little dream that everybody has, but I just don't know. I just don't know what to say about it. Yeah, it seems like there would be benefits, like you're saying, about people going to grab a drink, players as well. Yeah, I think it'd be good for the economy, to be honest with you. Uh, it's close proximity to the restaurants, um, which we don't have right now. Uh, a little pregame kind of thing. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of condos going up down there. So, yeah, it'd, it'd be good for, you know, Barry in general. Uh, it'd be good for location for us. It'd be good for our brand. But, yeah, again, I, I don't know where it's at right now. And it's, it just sounds like a, a pipe dream at this point. Because you like your location up love, in Midhurst love. right there. Love our field. A lot of good memories. I played there, won a championship there. Um, we're not homeless. <laughs> we have a place to play. Uh, you know, everybody's comfortable there. And, um, you know, it would be nicer if there was, you know, a bus line there or a little more convenience to get to our, our stadium. Or, um, you know, a lot of people know who we are, but they don't have a reason either to come out or don't want to check up there. So um, I get it. And I understand why a lot of people think it would be beneficial. Um, but again, we have a beautiful, beautiful stadium that if you've never been to, I'd encourage you to come out at least once. But if uh, the pieces fall into place, they fall into place. There was also an incident during a game against the <laughs> Toronto Maple Leafs on August uh, 7th. You tell me what happened during that scenario uh, and about a possible suspension or what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of what you're talking about, actually. <laughs> um, no, it was uh, you know a heated moment uh, in the game and the bench is cleared. And uh, by rule that if the bench is clear, the, the managers are, are stuck for three games. And uh, it's hard to hold back 20 guys, 20 strong athletic men. Um, but the idea is to, uh, you know, make sure that doesn't happen. And, um, there was no, there was no problems throughout the game. It just as a unfortunate incident, a player was trying to call time. The pitcher threw behind him. Um, he claimed that he had no intention to hit him. He just didn't know what, what the guy was doing at home plate. And, uh, it just, it, it probably didn't look great, obviously optics. Um, and then one thing led to another and there was a, a lot of heated people. So, um, that's what happened. And unfortunately I got stuck for six games, which is, uh, you know, as a first defense, four years as a, as a front office or manager and uh, four years in the, in the league as a player and eight years, that's my first defense. And that's quite the hammer uh, they put down on me. But it, it is what it is. And uh, they're allowing two games to be um, done next year. So it doesn't affect the playoffs. Speaking of the playoffs, being so close to last year and falling, is that the motivation kind of heading into these playoffs? Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, you know, we, we, we had it in our grasp and it's one of those things where we're such a young ball club and um, I said it when it happened, I stick by it, and I, I'm I'm still saying it now, is that I think that was one of the best things to happen to our, our regime. Um, you know, you get that taste, and, and even though it didn't come through, and obviously it's upsetting, um, we know what it takes, and we want it more than ever. And the guys are hungry, and it's exciting to be a part of it. It's exciting to see, and um, yeah, I'm just excited to, to go for the ride again. Baycats have had, just in the last like 10 years, mm-hmm. so much success. Uh, like you see it with other other um, teams, like maybe like the Golden State Warriors with the yeah. NBA. They, they yeah. win so much. Yeah. What needs to be that fire to keep them going? So yeah. uh, unfortunately, it would have been yeah. nice to win last yeah. year. But like you kind of yeah. said, that is like the fire that's needed. Yeah, it's a, little, it's a different ball club for sure. And I say regime because, uh, you know, the guys who did it before us won six in a row. Uh, they all retired. The entire team retired <laughs> collectively when I came on uh, right before COVID. So we rebuilt the team. Uh, sh- a short In the short three years, we were in the finals. So, you know, we're in four, year four now. And obviously ha- expectations are higher than ever and uh, back to the winning ways. But um, we like the pressure. We want the pressure. And we want to be in that position to have that pressure. So we're excited. What changes for the routine of maybe players, coaches, um, when you get to the playoffs? Is everything kind of the same or does things kind of start ramping up more? Maybe that mentality. Yeah, it's more of a mentality for sure. Um, you know, the pitchers want to go a little further into the game. Uh, you know, hitters want to hit it a little harder, you know, and contribute a little more. It, it counts, obviously, more than it does to a regular season. So while we obviously are trying to win all our regular season games, at the end of the day, as long as you make the playoffs, it really doesn't matter, right? So... Um, we do try to win every game. Doesn't always happen that way. That's baseball. But in the fi- in the finals and in the in the playoffs, it's uh, we go all out, right? And and the pitchers who you know come out in seven eight innings might go eight or nine uh, to save our bullpen and and just not give up the ball. So um, 
we have the right guys, we have the right pitchers, we have the right mentality. It's just exciting to you know put it all together and see how it works out. Throughout the season, do you feel like you have a kind of a good gauge of your players, kind of like to how to how to gauge them overall, like into the playoffs and and how to manage them? Overall? Yeah, yeah. I mean, most of the guys we've we've had more than one year. They're not new. Um, you know, for again our regime. Um, and we know what they're capable of, and obviously, in my head at least, <laughs> uh, we're a lot better than we, 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 you know, we show to be. Um, so I know what we're capable of, and if we play to our obviously capabilities, and I think we'll be okay. Do you feel like there is a change when, like, uh, when you go on the road and play on those road games? Do you can you feel it at all in your players or with you at all, like in no, the back of your mind, or not really? Just not, another not, game? Yeah, not really. It's another game. It's more the travel takes a little toll, and it's more the guys like. You got to remember, this is a working man's league, so guys are going their nine to fives and then jump in their car, or meet the bus out and wherever Brainford or London, and it's uh, it's quite a long day. And then they got to go back to work the next day, and then maybe we play the next day too. So um, it definitely takes a toll on the guys. You can see that, but um, at the end of the day, we're just playing baseball. We're just having fun. So um, and if they didn't want to be there, then they don't have to be right. So um, the fact that they're there, they want to be there. What do you want to say to the Baycats fans out there? If you've never been to a ball game, this would be a perfect time. Uh, get your playoff tickets. It is cheaper online for those looking for tickets than the box office. Um, but we we appreciate you know all the support, the community support, um, the love that we get. It's uh, it's special. It's a special community, and uh, we see a lot of support at the ballpark. It's it's so overwhelming. I can't explain in words, but we appreciate that. We love seeing you guys out. We love when the kids come out. Um, you know, make the memories with them and uh, have them on the field and the autographs and stuff like that. That's what it's all about, really. And that's why we do that. So uh, come out, support us. We'll try to give you guys a show, uh, but we'll try and, and give you guys some memories too. Yeah, well, thanks for coming in today. Thank you very much for having me. Game one of the playoffs tonight, August 22nd at Vintage Throne Stadium against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Who are those guys and gals in the vests wandering around specific parts of Barrie and other Simcoe County municipalities? Barry 360's Ian McLennan learning more about the community outreach program supported by the County of Simcoe. He's with the county's manager of social and community services, Mina Faze Baguette. I've heard people comment about uh, individuals they see um, in vests picking up uh, either garbage or interacting with people. The county launched a community safety team as a pilot in Barrie. How did this come to fruition? In 2023, uh, we launched a 10-point strategy on how to address homelessness. And one of the points that we wanted is we wanted to create safety and well-being for all, for people experiencing homelessness, but also for the larger community. The Community Safety uh, Ambassador Program that is operated by One Community Solutions is an agency that's been working out of Toronto that often works around shelters and homelessness programs in the city and things like bus and transit shelters. And they come from a lived experience approach where um, the owners and operators themselves uh, experienced homelessness and started this organization. And they really are a relationship-based program, engaging people who are street involved or experiencing homelessness and trying to refer them to the right services, but at the same time also commu- keeping the community as a whole safe by doing things like picking up drug paraphernalia or discarded hazardous waste or things like that, but also you know doing a little bit of a safety patrol walk, kind of engaging people who are probably in areas that maybe they shouldn't be and, and pointing them to the right programs, the daytime drop-ins, the food programs, other places where they can get the same services uh, they may be seeking. So the program, we launched it as a pilot in 23. Uh, we measured its outcomes and we felt it was it was producing a positive impact in the community, especially in the downtown business core. Um, and then we decided to expand the program and its patrols in Barrie, as well as in the cities of Aurelia, Midland, Collingwood and Wasega Beach. The interaction with both business owners, uh, downtown Barrie specifically, and the vulnerable, is it about relationship building? Absolutely. Like the idea here is you engage both. Uh, and try to become a bridge between the two. So if there's a business owner who's just uncomfortable engaging someone directly or doesn't really know how or doesn't have the skill sets to be able to to engage that person in a way that's effective, uh, this team is a lot, allows them that opportunity to do that by just calling them or, or flagging them and, and, and saying like, hey, over here on, you know, in front of my business, X, Y, and Z is happening. Could you help me out? Um, also for that, though, those people that, you know, are, are, you know, standing in front of that business or, or you know, 
resting in front of it, sometimes they can point them in the right direction and say, hey, did you know there's a cooling center around the corner or a warming center if it's winter time, and or there's a shelter daytime program or a food program. Why don't you go there and maybe connect on some of the other services you may need? And and you do that over time by, you know, first you ask their name and maybe the next time you offer them a bottle of water. And then the third time you might be familiar enough with them to offer them, hey, let me walk you down the street to the uh, to the shelter and see if there's something they can do about your shoes or or that jacket you might need. So that's really the, the theory behind uh, the engagement strategy for for that team. Now, I believe there was a survey done about a year ago in terms of the metrics to see what's working, what what's needed. What what came out of that, and is it working? Yeah, I think I think it's, it is working. Um, the the survey was really we did a baseline like the organization before it started. They did a baseline kind of assessment of the hot spots of the areas that they would need to engage, and then over the pilot, they started to build a patrol that's that touched all those points and, and you know, adapted to it as, as the different areas would change. Uh, at, at, towards the end of the summer last year in 2023, they did an evaluation of all their points of contact. This was like some of it was a head count of how many referrals they made. Some of it was a, a count of how many things were discarded or picked up weekly. Um, so then you start to see the flow. So, for example, for per- paraphernalia or drug paraphernalia, in their first few weeks, they were picking up in the thousands. And then towards by the end of the summer, it was it was averaging about 200 a week. So you can kind of start seeing um, there was like unaddressed discarded items that were then addressed. And then, then you're starting to understand the level of use of the discard and where it's happening. Um, with, with referrals, over time it grew. And the idea was more and more communications and conversations. They can, in, in, in last summer, they also had six um, life safety interventions with naloxone for people who would have probably overdosed and, and most likely died unattended. Um, so there was some life safety intervention. So all in all, I, I think I think the measure seems to be positive. And, you know, uh, I look at it as a service that didn't exist that now exists. So I, I can't see how it wouldn't be overall a positive contribution. to People people might say, well, don't we already have the E. Fry's, Elizabeth Fry, Busby Centre that does some of that outreach uh, are they two different animals here, so to speak? Absolutely. So I, I think for our, our current outreach teams that are out there doing outreach like Youth Haven and, and the Busby Center, um, those are th- the ones that we fund. Uh, th- their their focus is on housing outcomes and, and trying to engage people and, and try to bring them inside to access shelter or use uh, or, or, or uh, start to build housing plans. Whereas the community safety uh, team is more focused on safety and community well-being. So the idea here is is just to develop the relationship and then refer them to outreach if the person doesn't want to go. Or if they see a a hidden encampment, they call outreach and say, hey, outreach, can you go engage the encampment? We can make it safe, make sure there's any paraphernalia or things there. Or sometimes they come across an encampment that's been abandoned. So they let the outreach team know because maybe the outreach was outreaching someone there that's moved on. So at least they know that that person is no longer at that location. So I think the added information is helpful. I do think they are two separate entities with two separate goals. One of them is to engage the community at large and help them uh, in their day-to-day interactions with those experiencing homelessness, where outreach is just focused on engaging people who are experiencing homelessness and focused on trying to drive them towards housing outcomes. Well, we know homelessness is in every community, whether it's Barrier, really, Midland, Collingwood. But again, situations are unique. So why the expansion to uh, Aurelia, Collingwood, Midland? Was it requested? And what's different maybe than, say, Barrie? We, we operate a system at the county. Uh, as a system service manager, we, we understand that there's migration across the county, often in the summer from north to south. And uh, um, and then in, in, in the winter months, everybody kind of stays put to where they, they originate from or are more comfortable being at. So we understood that we needed to invest in a regional strategy in order to, to reduce the burden on our urban centers. So this is why we are investing in Midland and Aurelia and Collingwood and Wasega Beach um, because uh, and in South Simcoe is so that the pressure of, of migrating to the largest urban center, Barrie, would subside. Barrie represents, uh, you know, if there's 1,200 on average people on our by name list, which means that they've identified at one point or another in the last few months that they're in need of homelessness services, about 
around around 600 or a little under 600 are from are originating from Barrie, which means it's about 45 percent of the population is from Barrie. Um, so for us, we want to understand how we can serve people where they're at rather than have them seek services only in one or two places. So keep them in their, in the community? Keep them in the community they so choose to be in is, is really the key here. I mean, we've over and over again when we've opened up programs in Aurelia and offer, you know, clients from Barry to go there, they're not comfortable. And when we open up programs in Barry and ask clients from Aurelia to go utilize them, they're not comfortable. So the idea is here is to create enough space and programming across the county that people can be comfortable in the communities they've grown up in or the communities they're most familiar with. I know the homelessness obviously is so so complex, but at the end of the day, the bottom line for for the taxpayer too, how much is this program specifically? How is it being funded? By the provincial and federal governments uh, through funding that we receive as a system service manager. Uh, when we received the additional dollars in 2023, this was one of the key investments we made because it was it was something that was missing from our system. Um, so for the taxpayer, like the local taxpayer, it did not cost them anything uh, other, because it was provincially federally funded. But if you look at it as provincial and federal funding, then, of course, it's part of the larger tax base. Uh, but it's not any dissimilar to any community of, of this size. The, the county represents about five, uh, over 500,000 people, similar sizes to the region of Waterloo, uh, the region of Niagara, London, the city of London, the city of Hamilton and uh, other locations. But in, in just comparing uh, in terms of municipal tax spending, which is the tax base to answer your question, the region, for example, the region of Waterloo spends close to about $40 per, per person per experiencing homelessness. We're around the range of $7. Um, so it kind of tells you we're running an efficient system, one that is focused on utilizing federal and provincial funding first before we need to reach our, our own municipal tax base for services. A new ride coming to Canada's Wonderland next year, a new coaster, a launch coaster through Wonder Mountain, the Alpen Fury. Craig and MJ from the Rock 95 Morning Crew wanted to know more about it, so they called up Wonderland's Grace Peacock. This excited MJ too. Like she's a she's a coaster fanatic. I love them. <laughs> and this is a very unique one, Alpen Fury. Now, what what's so unique about it? Paint a picture for us, Grace. Well, this is a record-breaking launch coaster. It's going to be the longest, tallest, fastest launch coaster in Canada. And above and beyond that, it's also going to have the most inversions for a launch coaster in North America. Now, is that when it goes upside down? Yes. Okay. Twists oh. and turns and flips and that sort of thing. If so- you've seen the uh, video that's out, uh, it looks like a wild ride. But the coolest thing, in my opinion, is that this is going to interact with Wonder Mountain. So everybody knows our centerpiece mountain in the middle of the park. This is going to launch you into the depths of the mountain and then blast you straight out the top, oh, wow. 50 meters in the sky, before you go on this crazy journey with all these flips and turns. So wow. it'll be a lot of fun. What, what, what makes the timing right for this uh, this roller coaster to hit Canada's Wonderland next year? Well, it, we're always looking to bring something new every year, but we can't do a big roller coaster each time, obviously. And we've got to consider our guests and our demographics. We've got families with little kids. You know, so sometimes we have family rides coming in. Other times we've got a new water slide for the water park. But it's been it's been a few years since we had a roller coaster. Last one was Yukon Striker in twenty nine or yeah, twenty nineteen. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's it's time to get back to the thrill seekers and, and bring them a unique experience. And this is a very unique experience because it's not your typical roller coaster, a launch roller coaster. I mean, there's a couple in Wonderland, right? Uh, yes. yes. We have uh, Backlot and then the newest uh, kid coaster, Snoopy's Racing Railway. Is also right, that is a launch coaster. coaster. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that that qualifies a, as well. A, a gentle launch, but I love it nonetheless. Yeah, what I love about the launch one is that, um, well, obviously you have your... You know, you're stressed out where you're at the bottom getting ready to launch, but you don't have that giant drop at the top sort of thing. You know, like when you yeah. go up a long time and then that yeah, that <laughs> pin in your stomach sort of feeling. That's a great thing about the launch coaster. You're just in it. So you prefer a launch coaster over uh, ones that are, I'll go with both of them, but I love the idea of the launch coaster. That yeah. feeling you get right before you, like, shoot to the top is amazing. Right, right. Yeah. When uh, So when Wonderland um, wraps up its season, does, is that when the construction just starts right away? Oh no! It's actually been it's happening all season long. Oh, we've wow. uh, 
We started back in March. Um, we did need to remove an attraction, Extreme Sky Flyer, if you guys remember that one. Yes. Um, so that had to come out because we needed the land there. And construction has been happening in a few places all season. We've had construction fences up, and I know guests have been very curious. We've been putting uh, the footings and foundations down, um, rearranging some utilities. Um, it's a pretty busy park, so we have to rearrange some things to make space <laughs> for this beast. But um, it'll be a 14-month project in total. So we're aiming for spring next year. Oh, that nice. sounds exciting. So uh, it's going through the mountain, so it's not going to affect, because uh, Vortex also is around the mountain as well. Yes, right. Thunder Run and, Thunder and Run. Wonder Mountain's Guardians. So there's already three roller coasters that interact with the mountain, and this is going to be the fourth. But they're not compromised. It's just going to be a little bit of an extra challenge for our cruise kids. <laughs> <having a fourth. laughs> You're making well use of that mountain, I tell you. Yeah, <laughs> sure. My uncle tells me that he, he used to work construction, and he was one of the uh, crew members that uh, helped uh, create the mountain. Not created, oh, no but way. worked on. Yeah, way back when. Yeah, cool. When it was just yeah. farm fields. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if he wrote his initials in there somewhere. <laughs> just oh, that's, it. Cool. that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this sounds very exciting, and I can tell you're excited about it too. This is going to be uh, pretty epic. So. Yeah, we'll have to get you guys out to ride. Oh wow! Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go and support MJ. <laughs> <laughs> When you get a funnel cake flavor that's new, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for taking the time to tell us about it, Grace. Great. Thanks for having me. And that's our program for this week. Thanks to Ian and Will and the Rock 95 Morning Crew for their input, to Matt Ladder for his technical expertise, and to you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to What Barry's Talking About, rate it, review it. You can also keep up with What Barry's Talking About on X at Barry360, on our website, barry360.com, and there's our daily Kickstart podcast available from any streaming service and on our website. I'm Dan Blakely. Hope you'll join us again next week.